tower cranes have become indispensable in the construction industry. Nearly all major projects rely on tower cranes at some stage for material offloading and movement, as well as the placing of concrete and positioning of major elements such as beams, columns and cladding. However, along with the undeniable benefits a tower crane brings to a project, they also bring a high risk of fatal accidents if their installation and use is not properly planned, managed and supervised. The highest potential for a major incident to occur with the tower crane is during the erection and dismantling of the crane, but especially if climbing, sometimes called jacking, takes place. It is essential that the competency of the crane supplier is checked by the principal contractor before orders are placed and work commences on site. This short film has been developed to give construction teams a better understanding of the operation and guide them through the process necessary to ensure the high risk task of climbing a tower crane is completed safely. Where possible, tower cranes are normally erected to their full working height using a mobile crane to erect the mast and top elements. However, it is not always possible to erect the crane to its full required height during the initial erection operation. Climbing, which is extending the height of the crane by introducing additional mast sections, then becomes necessary. The principles of climbing a tower crane are fairly simple. First, a climbing frame is fitted to the mast of the crane. The new mast section is then lifted onto the climbing frame. This particular frame has a tray to accept the mast. The crane is then balanced about the ram position on the climbing frame, normally using a weight or a mast section at a predetermined radius. The joint between the crane head and the tower is unbolted. Next, the hydraulic ram of the climbing frame pushes the head of the crane up forming a gap between the mast and the crane top. The new mast section is inserted and joints reformed. The process is then repeated to add additional mast sections as required. In theory a simple process, but in practice the process is highly skilled with high risks of serious injuries if it is not strictly planned, controlled and supervised. So why are tower cranes climbed? The answer is simple. In some circumstances, there is no better alternative. Circumstances such as that the crane cannot always be erected to its full height at the initial erection stage. Access may not be available for a suitably large mobile crane to lift the components into place. Once at the full height required, the crane may require ties. And if the project is the construction of a new building, then there will not be a structure present to tie the crane to at the initial erection stage. And the crane may have to be climbed at several stages during the building's construction. Tower cranes may also need to be climbed down. This may be where the tower crane is used on a demolition project. And as the demolition takes place, higher level ties are lost, necessitating lowering of the crane or perhaps at the end of the project, where a mobile crane with sufficient reach is not available or cannot get access to dismantling the crane at its full height. The need for good planning, the strict implementation of safety measures and close supervision of climbing operations has been demonstrated by a number of incidents over the past few years. At Canary Wharf, three erectors died when a crane collapsed during climbing. In Shanghai, two died while climbing a crane. And in Miami, two died when a mast section was dropped on a project office during climbing operations. In Croydon, a crane collapsed during climbing. In this case, fortunately, no one died, but the operator was seriously injured. As earlier stated, planning and preparation is essential to help prevent such incidents. Planning for any climbing operation should take place at the earliest opportunity 
and form part of the overall planning process for the provision, erection and removal of the crane. The planning process is a joint activity and must include the crane supplier, the principal contractor and where the principal contractor is not the hirer, the hirer must also take part in the process. All site specific risks associated with the climb must be identified as early as possible to allow sufficient time for the development and implementation of any necessary precautions and safe systems of work. It is essential that even before the crane is erected that sufficient time is allowed in the project programme for the climbing of the crane. At times when the site is clear of personnel and areas adjacent to the site are at their least busy period. Agreement to footpath and road closures as well as railway track possession time to provide adequate exclusion zones may be required. Lay down areas within the radius of the tower crane will be needed for climbing frame fabrication and new mast section delivery. Anchorage points for access to temporary or permanent ties to be installed before or during climbing may need to be agreed together with the orientation of the mast. During the planning phase, a risk assessment and detailed method statement for the specific climbing operation on the specific site must be prepared by the crane provider's appointed person. It is the appointed person who will have overall responsibility for the planning and supervision of the climbing task. The risk assessment and method statement must take into account not only the general risks of climbing, but all those generated by the site and surrounding property and activities, as well as the climatic conditions. Typical sections of the safety method statement will include details of the supervisor and climbing crew, together with proof of their training and experience to climb the specific crane in question. The safe completion of the climbing operation is dependent on the skill and experience of the team. It is therefore essential that their competency is checked. The method statement must also include the number of mast sections to be added or removed, details of how to balance the crane, details of how to assemble and erect the climbing frame, detailed sequence of the works including hold points, points in the operation that must not be passed until critical safety checks have been made by the supervisor, for example checking bolt connections and guide rollers on the climbing frame before climbing commences. Details of all equipment used, weather limitations, exclusion zones, contingency plans if things go wrong, for example breakdown of equipment mid-climb, problems balancing the crane, a sudden increase in wind speeds, what rescue arrangements are in place for riggers who may fall and be suspended in a harness, and how can emergency technical advice be obtained quickly? Relevant check sheets to be completed by the supervisor. The manufacturer's manual and climbing instructions must also be available on the day. The risk assessment and method statement must be checked and agreed by the principal contractor well in advance of the works. A second on-site meeting must be held a maximum of seven days prior to the climb between the crane provider's appointed person, the principal contractor and hirer to ensure all arrangements are in place and the method statement still takes account of the current site conditions and risks. The verticality of the tower crane mast needs to be checked at this point by a site engineer to ensure it is within limits for climbing. Access arrangements for any ties to be fitted or removed also needs to be focused on together with reconfirmation of exclusion zones, unloading areas and who will arrange and who will provide what. In the days leading up to the climbing operation, close monitoring of expected weather conditions must take place and where conditions outside the manufacturer's specifications are expected, the operation must be postponed. Before any work can commence, there are a number of processes and checks that must be completed. The erection crew and any other new visitors to the site must receive a site induction that covers the site specific risks and hazards that are likely to be experienced during this time on site. Together with any necessary precautions and emergency arrangements. 
This must be followed by a method briefing given by the erection supervisor to his crew, the principal contractor's site management and any other trades that may interface with the operation so that all are aware of what is to happen and when. Checks must then be carried out to the extent and adequacy of any necessary exclusion zones, including the effectiveness of excluding unauthorised personnel. Checks should also be made to ensure the crew have worked together before and fully understand their roles, and that any lifting equipment and accessories have current, thorough examination certificates. The manufacturer's climbing instructions are available on site and are in a language that the climbing team fully understands and that the crane to be climbed is free from structural defects, is vertical and safe to climb. Finally, a weather check must be undertaken to ensure conditions are safe to carry out the climbing process. The Meteorological Office or a number of specialist organisations can be contacted by phone, email or online to obtain weather information specific to the area of the site and at a specific height to be worked at. These checks must be carried out by the crane erection supervisor together with the principal contractor's manager. Both must then sign a permit to allow works to commence. The climbing frame must first be offloaded and checked for defects. The frame should have been checked in the plant yard before leaving for site and a copy of the completed and signed pre-delivery checklist should accompany the frame. Climbing frame construction and use may differ from manufacturer to manufacturer and their specific instructions must be followed. However, the following is typical of the sequence and methods that will need to be employed. Once offloaded, the frame needs to be fitted onto the tower crane mast. The main section of the frame is lifted onto the mast and suspended by two climbing frame support lugs, which engage with brackets on the crane mast. The rest of the frame is then assembled. Once the frame is in place and hydraulic pumps installed, it must be checked by the erection supervisor and then thoroughly examined by an independent party. Any last minute adjustments are made such as checking the setting of the guide rollers. It is essential that the climbing frame climbing lugs are fully located on the mast brackets. It is also critical that the yoke beam of the ram fully engages with the mast brackets before the ram takes any load. It is these lugs that will hold the full weight of the crane top, which can often be in excess of 150 tonnes during the climb. With the climbing yoke correctly seated, 
the climbing frame lugs can be disengaged and the ram fully energised to climb the frame. Once the ram is at its full stroke, the climbing frame lugs are relocated onto a new higher bracket to take the load of the frame. The yoke is then disengaged and the ram retracted to raise and relocate the yoke to continue the climb. As the frame climbs, it engages with the head of the crane. The crane head is then bolted to the top of the climbing frame. The hydraulic pump and systems are then checked by the ram pushing the top of the climbing frame against the crane head whilst it is still bolted to the mast. This checks for hydraulic leaks and that sufficient pressure can be generated to lift the crane head during the climb and also reduces the potential for equipment failure at a critical stage. Once all is ready, the new mast section is placed on the climbing frame tray trolley. The trolley is secured to stop it rolling by securing pins. This particular trolley has locating spigots and arms to help place and retain the mast section. It is also good practice to secure the new mast section head to the climbing frame via strops or chains before it is unchained from the crane block to help prevent it toppling if the chains get snagged as they are removed or during the climbing operation. The crane now needs to be balanced such that the centre of gravity runs through the climbing frame ram. This balance must be achieved for the crane to be safely climbed. Balancing is normally achieved by suspending a known weight, sometimes a mast section, at a known radius, or setting a luffing jib at a set angle, or a combination of luffing angle and load. Manufacturers' instructions for doing this must be strictly adhered to. It is critical that inner and outer limits for radii or luffing angles to balance the crane as set by the manufacturer are not exceeded. From this point on, it is critical that the crane is not slewed. The slew brake must be applied and the crane slewing mechanism isolated. It is also critical that the manufacturer's balancing limits for luffing the jib or trolleying the load in or out are strictly adhered to. The balance must now be checked. With the crane top secured to the climbing frame, the nuts of the bolts joining the crane head to the top of the mast may now be slackened off but not removed. The ram is slightly pressurised so that it pushes the top of the crane up and breaks the joint. The supervisor then checks the balance by checking that the gap at the joint at each corner is the same dimension. If the gap dimensions vary, the crane is not in balance. 
If the crane is not initially in balance, balance may be achieved by slowly changing the radius at which the load is suspended, by trolleying in or out, or changing the luffing angle. However, it is critical that this is only done within the balancing limits set by the manufacturer. If the crane cannot be balanced, the climb must not proceed. The joint must be reformed and expert technical help obtained. Once the crane is in balance, the climb may proceed. However, every time before the crane head is raised, the wind speed must be checked using the crane's own or another suitable wind speed indicator to ensure it remains within the specified limits. The driver then leaves the cab and goes to a safe place. The nuts to the bolts joining the crane head to the top of the mast are now fully removed. The ram is pressurised and the extended to its full stroke. All the time the crane team constantly check that the crane is climbing vertically and true and that the climbing frame is acting correctly. It is during this period that the crane is in its most dangerous condition with the entire load being taken by the ram. The main frame acts as a guide and is not capable of taking torsion loads. Once at the top of the ram stroke, the climbing frame lugs are re-engaged onto new mast climbing brackets. Again, it is critical that these are properly engaged. The ram may now be retracted, which disengages the ram yoke beam, which may then be raised and located onto a new set of brackets before the ram is pressurised again and lifts the crane head again. In this way, the ram lifts the crane and the climbing frame then self climbs until it can lift the crane again. The number of cycles required to push the crane head up sufficiently to place a new mast section in will depend on the type of crane and climbing frame. The new mast section may now be inserted. The trolley safety pin is removed and the trolley with the new mast section pushed into place. Bolts are now inserted into the joint between the bottom of the new mast section and the top of the mast section below. The ram is slightly depressurised, allowing the new mast section to sit on the mast below and the joint to be formed. The erection team must ensure that the new mast sits correctly and evenly on all four legs of the mast below. The top joint between the new mast section and crane head is then formed by lowering the crane head onto the mast. It is again essential that during this process that the load of the crane top is taken smoothly and evenly on all four mast legs to prevent eccentric loads and the potential for the crane to topple. The bolts to all joints are then tightened to the correct torque and in the sequence specified by the manufacturer. Once all connections are reformed, the crane may lift another mast section onto the climbing frame tray, followed by rebalancing of the crane, rechecking of the wind speed and repetition of the climbing sequence. If the crane is not to be climbed further, the climbing frame will be disengaged from the crane head and should either be removed or lowered to the lowest possible position in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations. This is to reduce additional wind forces on the crane due to the presence of the frame. It is critical that the crane base and any ties have been designed to take these loads. Once the crane has been climbed to the height required, 
the crane supervisor then carries out a detailed pre-use inspection against a checklist. The crane is then load tested and inspected again by the crane supervisor and signed off. A thorough examination must then be undertaken by an independent third party. The crane must not be handed over or used until the thorough examination is completed and no Category A faults have been found that require immediate action. As already noted, it cannot be overemphasised how hazardous the climbing of tower cranes can be. It is essential that detailed planning takes place and that safe systems of work are strictly adhered to by skilled, experienced climbing teams. We hope this film has helped you understand the process and the need for diligence by all involved. It is only by fully applying these principles that this hazardous process can be completed incident and injury free. Further information about the safe erection Climbing, dismantling and use of tower cranes can be obtained free of charge from the Construction Plant Hire Association website.